Welcome to the online worship service of Triumph Lutheran Brethren Church. Triumph is a multi-site church in the Midwest with campuses in Moorhead, Minnesota and West Fargo, North Dakota. Our vision is to see the life and message of Jesus transform hearts, homes, and cities. We're grateful that you've joined us online as the Lord works through our ministry both locally and around the world. Wherever you are at, our prayer is that God would meet you and that the life and message of Jesus would transform your life. So today our call to worship is from Psalm 138. This is a Psalm of David. I will praise you, O Lord, with all my heart. Before the gods I will sing your praise. I will bow down toward your holy temple, and I will praise your name for your love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. When I called, you answered me. You made me bold and stout-hearted. May all the kings of the earth praise you, O Lord, when they hear the words of your mouth. May they sing of the ways of the Lord, for the glory of the Lord is great. Though the Lord is on high, he looks upon the lowly, but the proud he knows from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the anger of my foes. With your right hand, you save me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your love, O oh Lord, endures forever. Do not abandon the works of your hands. cross you came and broke them down you broke them down there were chains around us by your grace we are no longer bound no longer bound you call me out of the grave you call me into the light you call my name and then my heart came alive your love is greater your love is stronger
Again, we hear from God's word today, and this is recorded in 1 John chapter 4, beginning with verse 7. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. You saints of the Lord is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he has said to you whom for refuge to Jesus have fled.
Next week, we're going to talk about one of the most beautiful things that happens in the kingdom of God as we talk about caring, or in other words, love in action. Our text is 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 through 18, reading in Jesus' name. John, who actually described himself as the disciple that Jesus loved, wrote this as an older believer, reflecting on, on uh, of course, his three years of sharing life with Jesus, and then watching as the promises of Jesus uh, came true through the early church, as the Holy Spirit called and empowered and enabled the early church uh, to live out the life of Jesus in the settings where they lived. John wrote this in uh, 1 John chapter 3, beginning with verse 16. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. I think we've all had this happen to us some point uh, along our life's journey. As I was thinking about love in action this week or, or caring that honors Christ, I thought of that, uh, well, I'm going to call him the, the Brandon Good Samaritan. It happened a number of years ago as uh, I was traveling to the cities from our home in the Red River Valley and <clears throat> I uh, had been lost in thought, apparently, because I looked down and realized how dreadfully close uh, the, the needle on my dashboard was to empty. And because I was between Fergus Falls and Alexandria, I realized there wasn't going to be a lot of places close to the freeway uh, to, to pull over. So the next exit I saw was Brandon, and, and I pulled off, and as I, as I got off the freeway and rolled up to the stop sign, I realized I had a ways to go before there would be a gas station. So I headed in towards town and my, my vehicle started to lurch. And sure enough, uh, before I got to the city, I was out of gas and, and on the side of the road. Fortunately, it was an early evening, it was a beautiful summer night. And, and uh, this was before there were cell phones, so you know this was a little while ago. And I kind of just wondered what was going to happen when I heard uh, the crunch of gravel uh, behind my car and I, I looked back and here there was a pickup pulling up behind me. And out of the pickup junk, jumped a young man who, who had obviously put in a hard day's work. He was wearing the high visibility uh, t-shirt that guys do wear when they work in the trades, especially if they're working outside. Uh, I understood that he had been working up, actually been working up in the Red River Valley and and commuted there, uh, was coming home for the weekend to his home in Brandon. And he said to me, hey, but it looks like you could use some help, huh? And I explained that I was out of gas and he invited me to jump in his truck. And we drove the few miles into Brandon. Now, Brandon isn't a big town, so in the evening, it wasn't a guarantee that there would be a gas station open. And sure enough, there wasn't. But he pulled into a pulled up in front of a, a set of pumps and he said, I know these guys. And he went into the service bay and, and uh, had a conversation and out he came with a, with a gas can from the gas station there and, and we filled it up and headed back out to my vehicle and, 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 and filled up uh, enough gas in my car to get me back into Brandon where I could fill up my vehicle and go on. And he did this with just a sense of kindness and ease, like this was just the normal thing to do. And, uh, and as, uh, as the uh, encounter kind of uh, was, was wrapping up, you know, I was reaching for my wallet because I wanted to give him something for, for help. And he, he quickly protested. He said, no, 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 no. You don't have to give me anything. He said, uh, you just help someone else when you have a chance. You know, um, I, don't, I didn't ask him about his faith. I don't know if, if he was someone who would consider himself a believer, a follower in Jesus Christ. But I tell you this, he sure acted like one. And as we're going to see in our text this morning, that, that this sense of caring, of, of giving beyond ourselves, even at the point of inconvenience or, or even personal cost, is such a beautiful expression of, of the love that we have received uh, in, in Jesus Christ. In fact, uh, that, that young man reminded me of a very familiar uh, parable of Jesus. In Luke chapter 10, <clears throat> we read a story that again followed, um, Jesus told this story for a reason. 
Uh, Jesus lived this life uh, often under the scrutiny of, of those who were very religious but found that, that their religion was a matter of, of, uh, of knowing about Scripture, of rule-keeping, but had lost that sense of grace and compassion that really is what is the heartbeat of God. And, uh, and we are told that one day an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him a question. He said, teacher, what should we do to, in, to inherit eternal life? And Jesus replied, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? The man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Right, Jesus told him, do this and you will live. Well, the man wanted to justify his actions, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied with a story. He did this all the time. Jesus was awesome at telling stories that had a point. And sometimes the point was a bit sharp, but they were beautiful in explaining in, in down-to-earth terms that we can understand the ways of the kingdom of God. So this is his story. Jesus said a Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along, but when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. I wonder if he said, I'll pray for you. <laughs> anyway, let's keep going here. A temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed by on the other side. We aren't told their reasons for passing by, but I'm not going to be uh, uh, too judgy on these guys because I can't imagine the times in my life I've been aware, uh, made aware of an obvious need and had a really good reason uh, to pass by that opportunity, uh, either because of, of something on my agenda or uh, an evaluation I would make of that person or whatever. But anyway, so these two people that were engaged in the religious activity at the temple passed by this man who was obviously in dire need. This is where the story gets interesting. It says, then a despised Samaritan came along. A despised Samaritan. Let's kind of just unpack this a little bit. Um, there was a age old, old, old uh, uh, bitterness and rivalry between the Jewish people and the Samaritan people. And, and we aren't going to go into all the reasons why. It did have to do with a sense of, of religious pride and slipping into paganism. And, and it was kind of complicated. But just let's just say that, that if they were going to spend uh, the evening at a dinner table, they probably wouldn't pick each other. In fact, it probably was even worse than that. For example, Imagine that, uh, <clears throat> that uh, you pulled over to the side of the road to help someone, and they had a bumper sticker that said, I cheer for the Green Bay Packers, or whoever is playing the Minnesota Vikings. <laughs> yeah, I know, that's just a, mad, a matter of, uh, of rivalry. But how about this one? You're at a state park, and you're out for a ride, and, and uh, you notice that someone's having a little trouble with their bike, and they're pulled off the side of the road, and... And, and so you pull over, too, as you're wearing your Faith Over Fear t-shirt. And as they're tending to their bike, they look up, and, and they're wearing their Trust the Science t-shirt. And you think, okay, so how's this going to work? We've got a vaxxer and an anti-vaxxer here. Can we get along? Maybe you're thinking, oh, Pastor Jeff, why are you bringing that up? You know, one of the things about coming to worship is I, I would like to get away from all of this stuff that we're dealing with right now. But you know what? One of the things about being a follower of Jesus is not avoiding this stuff, but entering into the stuff and saying, what would Jesus, how would Jesus inform um, the life I'm living in and the issues I'm facing and, and even the opportunities I have? There is no doubt that a despised Samaritan would be, the, would be uh, logically the last person uh, to, to come to the aid of, of a Jewish person that was in great need. But, but he did. And that's what makes this such a radically beautiful picture of the gospel. So let's continue on. Um, a, a despised Samaritan came along and when he saw the man he felt compassion on him. But he did more than feel compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey and he took him to an inn where he took care of him. 
The next day he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, take care of this man, and if his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Now, Jesus said, which of the three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? In other words, who loved his neighbor? The man, the, uh, the man replied, well, the one who showed mercy. Then Jesus said, go and do likewise. This is a powerful picture of the gospel as we see love in action, as we see compassion that is not only inconvenient, but comes with a cost being extended to someone that, that, that probably didn't deserve it, but, but it, was, it, it was at least the right thing to do, and we'll discover even more. It's the perfect thing to do if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. You see, when we've come to know God, when we've come to know his grace and mercy to us in Jesus Christ, when we've come to know that we've been loved not because we're lovable, but because he has chosen to love us even in our sin, when we've been forgiven not because we deserve it or because our sin didn't matter, we don't even know how much our sin you know, offends a holy God, but he chooses to forgive us. And, 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 and we've been extended grace. And whenever we are called as kingdom people to love, to extend grace and to forgive, you'll notice in the scriptures it is, it is most often tied to remembering how God has chosen to deal with us. Yesterday morning, uh, I was reading in, a, in an introduction to the book of Jeremiah in my personal time in the morning, kind of early while the coffee's going. And uh, as I was reading the introduction, um, it was explaining that the prophet Jeremiah was called the weeping prophet because Jeremiah had been given the calling in life to experience in his heart God's broken heart over the waywardness of his covenant people, Israel. And because of, of, of the pain that God felt as his, and the frustration and even the anger he felt when his love was spurned and turned away from, Jeremiah had the calling of, 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 of proclaiming that to his neighbors and often being not only uh, not responded to, but often ridiculed for that. He was called the weeping prophet. Anyway, the, the author to the introduction was talking about, you know, the power of tears. And, and he, he uh, mentioned a time when he was living, living in Lebanon, the country just uh, north of Israel. And, and uh, he, um, he had heard of a tragedy that happened to a friend of his. His, his wife had been, had been murdered on the roads south of Beirut. And, uh, and he had the, um, the experience of going with him to identify her body. And he explained how, how he didn't, in his lifetime, he could not remember crying like he did at that moment. But he went on to say that as, uh, as the, uh, in a press room where, where the news media gathered, because this was a significant event, uh, more than just personally, but because of what was going on in the world at that time, and, and, they, were, and they were uh, talking to this man about the murder of his wife, uh, he, he stilled the room when he said, I forgive the person that killed my wife because Jesus Christ has forgiven me. And the author went on to talk about the tears in that room when that profound statement had been made. In other words, how God had treated this man affect, affected him to the point of, of extending radical forgiveness in this broken world. And today we're, we're talking about love. So we're called to be a, a caring people. We're, we're called to not just love with words, but love with action. And we do that because of the way that God loves us. In Romans 8 or 5, verse 8, we read this amazing verse. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And, and this is really um, important when we understand that, that, that the love of God was not just something that, that, that he revealed through visions or revealed through the prophets or reveal, I mean, he did all those things. But more than that, he took action. He demonstrated his love. The gospel rests in the sending of Jesus to bear the penalty of our sin. And the father watched as his son was brutalized and humiliated and, 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 and bore all that he bore so that you and I could know that, that our sins had been fully atoned for. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 
So we understand that as people that have been loved by God, the kind of love that we're called to is not something that, that he expects us to do uh, in and of ourselves to work up this kind of love. But that love comes as we reflect on the way that we have been loved. We have been loved by Heavenly Father who demonstrated his own love for us while we are still sinners. So the call to be a caring a community in a church, a caring person as a follower of Jesus, is, is rooted in the reality that God loves us. It's a response to the way that God loves us. And, and it's, it's more than words. It, it, it's, it's action. Perhaps uh, you've heard the story of Jesus with skin on. It's, it's a fairly familiar story, and, and I'll share it with you. First of all, because I, I think it's a wonderful story and, uh, and, and it fits so well with what we're talking about here today. It's, it's about a child who's afraid to sleep alone in a dark, stormy night. So she calls out to her mom from the darkness and her mom tells her, Honey, Jesus is right there beside you. And the little girl replies, But mom, right now I need Jesus with skin on. <laughs> Quite honestly, I think we all need Jesus with skin on from time to time, don't we? And so we understand that as, as, as we respond to God's uh, demonstrated love and, and we act on opportunities to, to demonstrate that, it's a, in a sense, we're Jesus with skin on coming to someone at a point of need. But this is a beautiful uh, aspect of, of when, when we love in action, when we care. There's a, another story, you know, Jesus told all these great stories. In Matthew 25, it's actually an illustration of, of, of the judgment day. And, and he's affirming those who had trusted him in this life, trusted him in, in this life. And of course, those who didn't hear about the, you know, the tragedy of eternity apart from God. And Jesus said this, when I was hungry, or the master in the story, which of course represents God or Jesus, when I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was a stranger, you invited me in. When, you needed clothes, when I needed clothes, you clothed me. And uh, when I was uh, in prison, you, you looked after me. You came and visited me. And Jesus kind of uh, culminates that story in Matthew 25 by saying, the king will reply. Uh, after, after these, these uh, ones that have just been blessed by him, and, 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 he, and Jesus says, you did it to me. And, and, and these people like you and me say, well, I, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or in prison? And the king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Now, let me just kind of unpack this just a little bit. We, we have said that when we go and we love in tangible ways, it's as if Jesus comes to that person with skin on. But this is beautiful. Just think of that. That person that we help is also Jesus with skin on. Christ says, that's me that you're helping. That's me that you're helping. He so identifies with that person in need that it's as if we're helping him. Let's just take this a little further. <clears throat> this, uh, this earlier in the last week, um, as again, it was that time of the day when the coffee's going, Another thing that I find helpful in just kind of my own relationship with God is, is talking to him in prayer and at times kind of journaling some thoughts. And, and, and most often I talk to him about my family. I go through my family by name, all of them, because I know he cares and it's something I can do. And one of the things that I've prayed often for my family, my kids and my grandkids, is that God would bring someone into their lives that would remind them of the goodness of God. That would point them, of course, to Jesus. And I'm so grateful when I hear of others that have done that. Been Jesus with skin on to my kids. I so appreciate a congregation in Duluth and Pastor Mike that uh, when I had family in Duluth, I appreciated how they provided a gospel place for my kids to uh, be reminded of God's love for them. I, uh, I, I was uh, so grateful that, that when we attended the church with them, I sought out the pastor to thank him personally. 
And don't tell anybody, but I think this is legal. I love supporting um, our, our congregation here financially. That's a privilege of being a Christian. But I think it's legal when your heart is moved to maybe give to another church once in a while, especially if you appreciate their ministry. I think of in this community where I've got grandkids growing up, and I, I think of them in, in the school system, and just talk to any teacher during these days about some of the pressures that are on teachers, administrators, and kids during this time in which we're living. And I love it when I know that my grandkids at the school just blocks from here where they, where they spend so much of their day, when they spot uh, a Mrs. Hansen or Mr. Olson or another one of the, of the teachers or staff that I know are a follower of Jesus, I'm so grateful for their, that they're there because I know what it means when they look at this teacher and, and they know that they're a follower of Jesus. It's like, again, Jesus has met them with skin on. Isn't this beautiful? This is the life that we're called to. Not only to believe in a truth that has been proclaimed to us, and, and that believing in Jesus and what he has done for us is, is the most important aspect of our lives. But we get this way of expressing our gratitude and also participating in God's uh, ongoing mission to love a broken world back to himself through what he has done for us in Jesus. Well, we're going to we're going to wrap this up now, but this is such an important part of, of, of our lives as followers of Jesus. Uh, Jesus' brother, James, who was, was, incidentally, he was a late adapter to believing in Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God. Hard to blame him. He, he grew up in the same home with him, and he was as human as the rest of us. But after Jesus' resurrection, of course, uh, James uh, became not only a believer, but a devoted follower and the author of the letter uh, that we call James. He wrote, suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. And so we see that there is a God in heaven and he is real and he is active in this world and, and, and he cares about the needs around us. And we pray, don't we? Your kingdom come, your will be done. How does that happen? It happens through his kingdom people. And, and Martin Luther once said, when we pray that prayer, you know, your kingdom come. We know that his kingdom will come with or without our prayers. But we pray in this petition, may it come among us. May it come through us. So why do we care? We care because it's an essential aspect of being a follower of Jesus Christ. And different congregations have different ways of kind of organizing care, which is beautiful. Uh, here at, at our congregation, we have a prayer chain where people have the opportunity not only to pray, but in praying, they're often prompted to extend care in a way that, that they can to someone in need. Our parish nurses are on the front lines of caring for people going through a difficult time, and we're so grateful for them, and we pray for them. And our deacons realize that there are times when people hit a kind of a rough patch in life and, and just need some practical help in, in, in food or, or help with some other life expenses or, or encouragement. And, and we're so grateful that this is part of, of, of the life of the church. But more than part of the life of the church in a program sense, God is calling us in a lifestyle sense to remember that uh, God has, has radically demonstrated his love for us and gives us opportunity to do that for others. Well, as we wrap this up, I can imagine there might be a young mom out there that's saying, oh, Pastor Jeff, I know I'm to care for others, but I am like up to my eyeballs and, and managing this home with these kids. And, and let me just say to you, you know what God's will for you is right now? How to love in action? It's to pour your life and love into those kids. God loves those kids and you're on the front lines of taking care of them. There might be another of you that's in a different season in life saying, you know, it's not the kids anymore. Although even when our kids are adults, they still need care. I've got aging parents now that are losing their ability to live independently and we're trying to care for them and help them discern when to maybe be in a place where they get a little more help. That can be so consuming. You think God knows that? He sure does. 
What does it mean to put love in action? It means to take care of your mom and dad because they took care of you when you were younger. And within the body of Christ, as we are any congregation, sometimes we're, we're told that, you know, we don't want to be too inwardly focused. We don't want to be just caring for our own. Yeah, only we can take that out, but we do want to be caring for our own. Because you know what Jesus said? He said, a new commandment I give you, love one another. As, you have, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, by this everyone will know that you are my disciple if you love one another. In other words, the way that a, that a, that a Christian community cares for each other is a beautiful uh, supporting context for the gospel. As we share our faith and invite people to come and follow Jesus, and, and, and they see a, a group of people that is struggling with unity and grudges, and yeah, I know it's probably not your church, and not our church, of course, but struggling with these kinds of issues, they have a right to say, why would I want to follow Jesus if that's what it's like to live in community with him? So certainly none of us are perfect, but it kind of ups the understanding of why it is so vital that we not only love with words and speech, but in actions and in truth. So we close this up just in awe at the wonder of being a child of God and, and just really the glory of the kingdom of God. And we look forward to the day when, when Jesus returns and everything is set, set right. But until that time, those of us that have come to believe in him, acknowledge him as our Lord, right? Because Jesus is Lord, caring is a core characteristic of the kingdom culture. And it's a beautiful reflection of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for... Uh, the call to love. We thank you for the powerful things that happen when we take you at your word, that we not only have a way to respond with gratitude to what you've done for us, we have a, an opportunity to actually be your presence, to be Jesus with skin on in the life of another. And we bless your heart because you, you love that person that, that, that we reach out to. And when we bless that person, we're blessing your heart. And so may we be uh, ever mindful that, uh, that you are a real God and that you are working in a real world and you use ordinary people like us to do your extraordinary work. May as a watching world views what the followers of Jesus are doing these days, including us, may they say, wow, look how they love each other. Jesus must have come from God in heaven. If that's what Jesus is like, I should think about surrendering my life to him. Thank you, Lord. We pray this in your name. Amen. Come thou fount of every blessing to my heart do sing thy grace streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise teach me some melodious song sung by flaming tongues above praise the mount I fixed upon it mount of thy Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of
Receive as a benediction today the words of the Apostle Paul from Romans 15. May the God of peace fill you with all joy and hope as you trust in him, so that you will overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for tuning in. We would love to help you get connected further to Triumph. And there are a few ways that you can do that. First of all, we would love to pray for you. Prayer is a critical part of our church and our staff gathers every week to pray for all the requests that we receive. You can head on over to triumphlbc.org slash prayer. Let us know how we can pray for you. If you are looking for an in-person worship experience, we would love to see you at one of our campuses. At our West Campus, we have services on Sundays at 9 and 11 a.m. and again Wednesday evening at 6. At our East Campus in Moorhead, we have Sunday morning services at 9 and 10.30 a.m. Join us next week online or in person as we continue our series entitled Resolute, where we examine what it means to fulfill the mission and vision of our church. You won't want to miss it.